invite you to turn in the Word of God this evening to the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. doing a study in the Gospel of Luke, and while it is uh, not a particularly short book in the Word of God, I find time and time again I just want to slow down a little more than what on the first look I, I desire. I want to kind of sometimes take a larger section and deal with it all, and then as I look more and more at it, end up thinking, well, we're not going to get through all of that, so let's just stop a little longer. So we're coming to the passage that deals with Simeon, and again we're not going to deal with all of it here this evening, but we'll deal with the opening part. And so we're going to commence reading from verse 22, just to get context of the time and season of what's going on here. Mary and Joseph going to the temple in Jerusalem with the Lord Jesus and then the individuals that are here. So we'll read from verse 22 and take time to read through to the end of verse 35. Let's hear the precious word of God, Luke chapter 2, verse 22. When the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, Every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. They came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him, And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Amen. Ending there at verse 35. Let's trust the Lord to bless his word and let us come prayerfully with the desire that it may be opened by the Spirit of God and be used to the edification of our souls. Let's pray. Let's seek the Lord momentarily. Lord, it's been good for us to be here already, to be among thy people singing the praises of our Lord Jesus. We confess that there is too little joy in all of our hearts. And we confess that part of that is to do with our own sinfulness, Part of it is to do with the pressing experiences of life in a world that has fallen. But forgive us for our sins. Help us to constantly abide in the vine and to behold the beauty of the Lord. We pray tonight that as the word is open, that it may not merely be physically opened and set upon our laps, but that our hearts may be in tune, our eyes may be enlightened, our spirits may be receptive to hearing from Thee and being taught of the Lord, that Thou wilt open up Thy Word by the Spirit. There are hearts and souls here ready and waiting and desiring to hear a word from God that no preacher can supply. And we ask that Thou wilt do for them, even as Thou didst for Simeon, giving a word and season. We pray Thy blessing, therefore, upon the ministry this evening. In power the preacher, we cast ourselves upon Thee. We have no power of ourselves. We therefore rest in the Holy Ghost. We ask that His ministry 
may be abundantly manifest in those that are thy people as well as those that are lost. Come, do thy work, extend thy kingdom, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The scene before us, beloved, is that of Mary and Joseph bringing the child, Jesus Christ, into the temple to offer a sacrifice according to the law of Moses. Engaging in this ceremony, as we saw last Lord's Day, was a reminder for all that when we bring life into this world, we bring life that is tainted by sin. When we see the Lord Jesus, of course, engaging and being submitted to these ceremonies, it is a reminder to us that he willingly gave himself to identify with sinners. When the whole plan of salvation is coming together in eternity past, as it were, and there is this desire in the Trinity to save men and to have a people for themselves, even there there is a recognition that the law that would be laid down, that the Son of God would have to submit himself to, all of these details are already there in the mind before it ever comes to pass. And when the Lord Jesus comes into this world, it involves this identifying with the people He is coming to save and engaging in ceremonies that reflected their sinfulness. And by His submitting Himself to these ceremonies, showing that He is identifying with them in their greatest need, bearing their sins upon His own body, even in His infancy, at 40 days old, even prior to that, at 8 days old, at the circumcision, we see, we see the submission of the Son of God to identify with sinners. Christ came to be the substitute for sinners. He came to stand in their place. He came to take the judgment and wrath that they deserve. And as He comes and enters into this world, it involves being submitted to all the law of Moses to perform everything that it specifies. As Joseph and Mary attend to the details of the purification and presentation ceremonies, the Spirit of God then draws our attention to some of the individuals that are present in the temple at that time. These details are not, again, something that we should pass over or ignore. They are to help us to rejoice in the occasion and the wonderful way in which the Lord works to give further testimony to the arrival of the Messiah. One of them, of course, is Simeon, and the other is Anna. We've already seen the shepherds, and it was somewhat, I think, uh, right for the shepherds to be the first to be invited to come and see the Lord Jesus, that those that are shepherds would come to see the good shepherd, or those that were tending to lambs would, would leave their lambs and go to see the Lamb of God. But with them having seen and testified to the grace of God in sending the Son of God into the world, we then move to other testimony that occurs here in the temple through these more aged individuals, if you like, if we can use that term. Uh, there is an assumption, of course, that Simeon is old. We're not told that, but I think it's almost universal through the commentators and the scholars that it we're safe to assume that Simeon was in the, the, the more, let's say, evening, evening uh, side of life as well as Anna, that we're well aware, was a more aged individual. And so we are brought to see these two more senior individuals rejoicing in the Messiah and bearing testimony to God's mercy in the sending of His Son. I don't know if Simeon was aware of just how much God was using him and was going to use him down through the ages. I think it likely that he had no idea. And as I thought about that, I thought about how it is important that when we get on in years and get that little bit older, and we haven't quite the same energy and powers that we once had, that we do not put ourselves upon a shelf and say, I can't be of blessing to the church anymore. Simeon here, Anna as well, are older, that is sure, that, of that there's no doubt, and they're being mightily used to testify of God's salvation and what He is doing. This is laid down for us, for all of posterity, for all the church of God, to see these, these aged individuals being a blessing to the church. As long as you are in the world, beloved, the Lord will use you. He will. The very fact you're still living and breathing is evidence and testimony to the fact He is using you and intends to use you. 
And maybe, like Samson, you will slay more in your death than you ever did in your life. You just don't know what God is doing with you. And so we come even to a passage like this before we even begin to look at the text. I say to the seniors of the congregation, be encouraged. Be encouraged that we have here individuals that, again, are are older in years and on in life, as it were, perhaps closer to death than, than they even were aware of. But they are rejoicing in the Lord. They are serving as instruments in the hand of God to be a blessing to the church. Psalm 92, verses 13 through 15 says that those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. And that's the testimony even of the, the, those that are bringing forth fruit in old age. They're fat and flourishing. They're bearing fruit onto the Lord and they're showing the Lord is upright. You see, the young will go through experiences where they will doubt the goodness of God. They will go through experiences where they wonder, what is God doing here? And what the aged are able to do is to testify that the Lord is upright. They're able to testify through years of experience, there is no unrighteousness in Him. Because they've come through those trials. They've faced the valleys. They've been through them all. And they can testify that God has been good all the time. He has been faithful to His Word. He has never let us down. He has always been there. And that is one of the chief ways in which God uses those that are old age, as the language is in the psalm. They bring forth fruit in testifying to others of the goodness and mercy and blessings of God even in the trying times of life. They've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, and testify God is good all the time. And the young people need that. The young people need to see those who have proven the Lord. And they need to see the testimony, not of a bunch of old and grouchy professing Christians that are just hanging in there waiting for the Lord to call them home, but those that are flourishing in the joy of the Lord, that He has been faithful time after time, year after year, God has been there. His Word is sure. His blessings are secured in Christ The law of God tells us in the book of Leviticus to those that fear God, they are to rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man. And that's what we're doing tonight. We're looking to Simeon and want to hear his testimony and rise up before perhaps this hoary-headed individual and show respect to a man who had proved the Lord over years. The Lord Jesus is just 40 days old. And on this occasion, Simeon is present to be a testimony to us. So let us give attention to him. In many ways, he's like Abraham. We read of Abraham as he was waiting upon God to give that promised son that was was promised to him. In, In Romans chapter 4, verses 18 through 21, it's said of Abraham, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And Simeon is like this. Here he is, a man, waiting upon the Lord. Verse 26, It was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And so he's able to say in verse 29, Now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, and so on. Here's a man that has been waiting upon God, and he has not staggered at the promise of God through unbelief. He has waited and waited and waited and consistently he has come to the temple looking for the fulfillment of the promise. And I imagine that there were some scoffers. I imagine there were those that were asking Simeon, why are you at the temple every day? What are you here for? What are you doing? And they would get into conversation 
and no doubt it would come out of him that he has, he has had this word from God and he's waiting for its fulfillment and he's desiring to see the Messiah. And the scoffers, the unbelievers, they're looking on and they're saying, oh, Simeon, <laughs> he's waiting for the Messiah. You know, we've been waiting for the Messiah for centuries. We've been waiting for him all this time and, and he has not come yet. And, and there's Simeon. Simeon thinks he's, got, he's, he's one of the chosen few. He, he's going to see him. But this did not put him off. When you receive a word from God, when God gives you a promise, and even bring it back even to the very salvation you possess, beloved, when God makes a promise, do not let people mock you as you hold on to that promise. The world will say, you're crazy imagining that your sins are forgiven, that you're on the way to hev heaven. How do you know that? How can you be so sure? Even those that are religious, that have their form of religion and what they exercise themselves in with regard to their religion, for you to say, I know I'm going to heaven. I'm absolutely certain of it. Even those within Christian circles will put a question mark over the youth who would say they know they are saved. Found among certain circles of hyper-Calvinistic persuasion, they would put question marks upon the young that would say that they know the Lord has saved them. But God promises to save. Christ says that if you come to Him, He will not cast you out. This is His Word. And the soul that trusts in God doesn't have to question it. They see the Word and the promise as it is, and they rest in it. Simeon has been resting in the promise of God for many, many years. And so, as we consider Simeon tonight and next Lord's Day as well, we're considering him, Simeon, a man that staggered not at the promise of God. A man that staggered not at the promise of God. And we're just looking at one main point here this evening that really encapsulates his character, Simeon's character, in the opening three verses of our text, from verse 25 through verse 27. We read there, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, and so on and so forth. We're told what unfolds then after that. Note with me, first of all, his place. We're told in verse 25, there was a man in Jerusalem. A man in Jerusalem. Some have thought Simeon to have been a priest. Others have suggested that he, he was perhaps a retired priest, knowing that the priests would retire from their, their, their active involvement in ministry and their, their focus upon the central activity of offering sacrifices at 50 years of age. Many of them would go on to help around the temple and do various chores, but there was a retirement for the priest. And perhaps he was a retired priest. The way he lifts up the Lord Jesus and blesses him would be activity that would be common among the priests, but we're not sure. Did he live in Jerusalem? Or is he in Jerusalem just for this time? We cannot be certain. It may be that the testimony of the shepherds had begun, had begun to, to uh, go around the entire area. If you look at verse 20, just to remind yourselves of, of what happened after the events that the shepherds faced, we're told that they returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And they, they go returning, glorifying. So they're, they're talking about it. They're praising the Lord for this. this. This this is not being held back. And they're rejoicing in what the Lord has done. And, and I have no doubt, because they lived within the vicinity of Jerusalem, I have no doubt that some of the things are beginning to spread. Over a month has passed, and I'm quite certain that the shepherds would have spoken to their wives, other family members. That would begin to spread through them. Talk, again, maybe positively with joy and expectation. On the other hand, with, with mockery as to what they're saying happened. But regardless, there is this spreading of anticipation among certain individuals. You see there, even in verse 38, referring to Anna, she gives thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Here's another individual who's testifying continually of what the Lord is doing and rejoicing in this expectation of the Lord sending his son, the Messiah, coming to the world. So again, we don't know exactly whether he lived there or whether he had made a deliberate choice to be in the vicinity of Jerusalem. 
But the point is this. In his anticipation of God fulfilling the word, Simeon puts himself in the place where it's most likely for him to see the fulfillment of that word in Jerusalem. Now, what is the word? What was he promised? He was promised that he would see the Lord's Christ. He is promised, if we can use the language of the Greeks that came to Philip on that occasion in John 12, we would see Jesus. And this is a desire of his heart. As God has promised to him, you will see the Lord's Christ. You will see him. And as he prepares himself to see the fulfillment of that word, he puts himself in Jerusalem. There are places that are more conducive to see the desire of the heart fulfilled. Now that's instructive for us. Every single person here tonight that's going to go to heaven needs to see Christ. You need to see Christ. You need to see Him in a meaningful way in which you see Him as the only answer for your sin, God's answer for your soul, the only one that can wash away your sins, deal with the problem, the enmity that exists between you and God, you need to see Jesus Christ. You need to see Christ if you're ever going to have your sins washed away. You must see Jesus Christ. Now, if that is to happen, there are places you can go and be that are more conducive for the fulfillment of that very thing. If you avoid the Word of God, if you avoid the place of corporate worship, if you avoid Christians, you're avoiding the means that God uses to show you Jesus Christ. There has to be in your heart, if you ever want to be in heaven, there has to be first a realization, I must see Jesus Christ. And in that desire, in that longing, you can take from the wisdom of Simeon this lesson, I must put myself where I'm most likely to see Him. And where are you most likely to see Him? I've already said. In the Word of God. The Word of God is not just for Christians, those that love the Lord, those that are saved. Primarily it is for them, their sanctification. But the Word of God is absolutely necessary if you, the seeking sinner, those longing to be saved and have your sins forgiven, the Word of God is essential for you. You should be perusing the Word of God, reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, giving yourself to the Word of God. I think of my children, and they they hear the Word of God read before them, and they're very familiar with, with much of it already at an early age. And yet I'm still looking for their keen desire after the Word, their own pursuit after the Word. I see glimmers of it. I see elements of it but you're wanting to see their own pursuit after Jesus Christ in the Word. Their own longing to see what God's Word says. And as they grow older, that needs to mature and develop. And I trust that God has mercy upon their souls. They're truly and genuinely saved and walking in His ways. And it manifests itself in a continual desire to see Christ. But as parents, we know that our children need the Word of God long before they ever profess faith, we put the Word of God before them. It's an instrument that God uses. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And we put the Word of God before them. We also bring them to the house of God. That's another thing you do. You come to the house of God. The person that should most frequent the house of God is the person that most needs to see Jesus Christ. Simeon comes to Jerusalem, he's there in Jerusalem, he's coming to the temple, he's present in the place where he is most likely to see Jesus Christ. I trust no one here in any way despises the attendance, the means of grace, coming to the house of God, being with the people of God. This is Jerusalem for you. It is here amongst this company in corporate worship in this fashion that you're most likely to see Jesus Christ.
This is the place where Simeon was. He was in a man in Jerusalem. Let us see also his practice. We are told the same man was just and devout. He was just and devout. And we could debate over exactly what is meant by the term just. Is it the fact that he was declared just, declared righteous, this is his justification, or is this him living righteously, living in a just and righteous fashion? The emphasis, I think, is upon the latter. The former, of course, is true. Simeon is a child of God. He is justified freely by grace. He's had righteousness imputed to him because he has faith. He has trusted. He has rested in the promise of God to save his soul. And so his life manifests what was really true within his heart. He's a man living justly and devoutly. The idea of being just then is a sense of doing what is right. Living his life according to what God would require and ask of him. This is the testimony of his life. The same man was just. He was just. He did right. The way he conducted his affairs, the decisions he made in his life, they all come under this, that that which Simeon did, the way Simeon lived, was just. But not only was it just, it was devout. Devout has a sense of spiritual caution. He was a man who walked circumspectly before God, very conscious of the Lord's presence in his life and desires to maintain that. There's devotion in his heart. It's not just the letter of the law. It's not just doing it because it says you have to do it. There is heart in it. There's, there's relationship. There is a love for the Lord. This is manifested then in his devotion. And if I understand these terms correctly, they apply to both tables of the law. He lives justly. That's the second table of the law. That relates to his relationship with his fellow man. He does what is right. And you go down through the latter part of the law of God, the commandments of God, you see how we are to relate to our neighbor. That's living justly. Living devoutly relates to the first table of the law, that which correlates with our relationship with God. And he is bringing both together. Here's a man that is living out the law of God insofar as the Spirit enables him. He is doing this with desire and with heart. And he's an example to all that are around. He is just and devout. Just and devout. Now, beloved, we read this in a context in which they were greatly uh, disadvantaged in comparison to ourselves. Simeon did not have the New Testament Scriptures. He didn't have all this, this, this massive chunk of our Bibles. He did not possess that. And he's living for God. He's doing his best to uphold and honor God and reflect his appreciation for God's grace in his life. And so this is how he can be described. Just and devout. That, that beloved, is something to aspire to. That is something to pray for. That is something we should long that God manifests within our own lives with the same consistency that seems to be indicated by this man's life. Just and devout. We are not to compartmentalize our lives. I am devout when I come to church. I am just whenever Christians are present and they can see the decisions I make. And the rest of the time I just make decisions like an ungodly wretch would. A man who has no fear of God. That is not right. That's, that's an indication of a lack of genuine saving grace. A lack of the Holy Spirit. And as we shall see, this man is led of the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is upon him. And it's for that reason he is living this way. The Holy Spirit manifests his power in his life. That's what we're told at the end of verse 25. The Holy Ghost was upon him. We'll look at that in just a moment. But the fact that the Holy Ghost was upon him first empowered him to be just and devout and enabled him to be just and devout. That's regenerating grace. That's the sanctifying power of the Spirit in his life. At the same time, it may be suggested that the Holy Ghost continues to abide and exercise his power upon his life so that he consistently lives this way because he desires it. 
He longs for it. And when a Christian gets to a point where they begin to resist the Holy Ghost and resist the will of God, the Spirit of God departs from them and they begin to indicate signs of apostasy in their lives. You need to search your heart. I do as well at times. I, I, there's a need to search and just ask, are there early signs of apostasy in my heart? By the simple fact that I have no desire to be just and devout. If I'm really the Lord's, I'm manifesting the power of the Spirit in my life, He will be empowering and enabling me to be just and devout. He will be promoting that in my life, pushing me toward it. When I stray, I will sense, I will sense the, the speaking voice of the Spirit through His Word, appealing to my conscience, moving my heart in the direction of repentance and fresh, fresh graces of faith, experience of fresh waves of, of believing the Lord and His mercies toward me, seeing fresh, afresh the, 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 the power of the gospel and the cross work of Jesus Christ. So this is his practice. He is just and devout. We have thirdly his patience as well. He is waiting for the consolation of Israel. He is waiting for the consolation of Israel. The consolation of Israel is a term that just refers to the, the Messiah himself. Again, we'll look at that in just a second. But to summarize simply, it is a sense of comfort. The comfort of Israel is Jesus Christ. And he is waiting for Jesus Christ. Patiently waiting. He is waiting because first, as we know, he has been instructed by the Spirit of God that he's going to see the Lord's Christ. And so he's waiting because he has this promise. But even the Word of God itself to every, every believing Jew indicated this need for patience as well. Isaiah 25, verse 9, And it shall be said in that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him, and He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. We will be glad and rejoice in His salvation. What a text. And this was right there in the Old Testament Scriptures as an encouragement to every believing Jew longing for the dawn of God's salvation through the person of His Son. They waited for Him. He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. We will be glad and rejoice in His salvation. And so they were all waiting for the Lord. They were all waiting for the consolation of Israel, looking for that comfort that God gives to His people. Patience. Yes, the Lord asks us to be patient, doesn't He? This is a very specific and narrow sense in which he is being patient. I mean, again, I don't know how many years Simeon's been waiting. I'm inclined to think that this revelation of the Spirit of God to him came many, many years ago. I'm inclined to think that it had been a long time that he had been anticipating the fulfillment of this promise. I can't say that for sure, but I think the whole tenor of the passage and, and the elevation of this particular individual as an example for us, is showing that, that sense of faithful persistence in waiting for God to fulfill His Word. And that is something that we often are faced with. It is the waiting for God to fulfill His Word. As we get older, as Simeon, was getting older. There is a difficulty that's faced by Christians in this life. The same thing that was faced really by the Apostle Paul, only perhaps for different reasons at times. He felt this desire to depart, to be with Christ, which is far better, but understood it was more needful to remain for the sake of the church. And he felt that intensely. Being not as spiritual as the Apostle Paul, we at times feel similarly as we get older. The aches, the pains, the things that 
old age bring that are inconvenient. <laughs> we long for their passing, and we know that that will come about through the glorification of the body. When it is absent from the body, present with the Lord. And this vile body will put it off, and will have a body fashioned like unto His glorious body. That we look forward to. But in life, of course, there are those appeals to us. Family, children, grandchildren, other things that clamor for our attention and for our affection. Both of them require patience. I've met some believers and it doesn't matter what other elements there are within their lives, their children and so on. It doesn't really matter. They're just longing to go to glory. There's one particular individual that always comes to my mind. When I think about that, and I'm sure that they come to Melanie's mind as well. And she was always talking about, just, I just want to go to heaven. I just want to go to heaven. She wasn't particularly old, but she just wanted to go to heaven. She would talk about it all the time. She's still not in heaven. She's still on the earth. And what's she doing in the years that I've known her saying those things? She's been waiting. Just patiently waiting. Wanting the Lord to take her home. Waiting. Through that waiting, the Lord exercises her in, in matters of grace. Through that waiting, she, she is stretched spiritually. There are perhaps mornings she wakes up where she pines for glory even more fervently than at other times, but she is made to wait. And again, on the other hand, the things that tie us to this earth, the burdens, whether it be the care of the churches, care of family, all things that have their, their rightful place within our lives, again, we, uh, on many, in many ways, we are, we're called upon to wait. We long for that child to be saved, and God says, wait, and we wonder why. How does it glorify you, Lord, by the continual waiting? Would it not be more glorifying to you if they were saved now, manifesting your glory through a life that is empowered by the Spirit and sanctified daily? And we bring our arguments. I'm sure you've brought them. You argue before the Lord. Why, Lord? Why? How long, O God? God exercises patience. Simeon has his patience vindicated. All of his waiting has not been in vain. I wonder in a certain sense as he progressed toward eternity, as every day would pass and he would get older, that his priorities were narrowing and narrowing and narrowing and narrowing. His reasons for living, for existing, for being upon the earth became fewer and fewer and fewer. Until it gets to this point, and we'll get to it next week, where he says, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. I have nothing else left to live for. I've just been waiting for this. It's all been this, just to see and behold thy Son, our Messiah. Now he's ready to go. <laughs> his whole life, I'm sure he had, he had many things within his life, and his, but as he got older, they, they just narrowed and narrowed and narrowed in until his reason for living was one thing, to see God fulfill his word. Maybe he might have reached a point at times where he thought, you know, I'd rather just go to heaven. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not too interested in seeing the word fulfilled anymore. I just, I, just, I just want to go to glory. We don't know how old he was. Maybe he was very, very old. But he waits on, and his patience is vindicated. So it will be for the martyrs, those who are under the altar, who cry, how long, O oh Lord? They cry for God to come and vindicate them in their testimony. They pray for the day in which justice is meted out. They long for it. 
And they cry, how long? But it will come. It will come. We have then his power. His power is noted in the reference to the Holy Ghost being upon him. The Holy Ghost was upon him. Luke gives particular attention to the work of the Holy Spirit, both in his gospel as well as in the book of Acts. Many of you will know that. We've already seen his making mention of the fact that Zechariah was filled with the Holy Ghost, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost came upon Mary. He has put emphasis upon the activity of the Holy Ghost, and here he does so again. This is Simeon now, and it's, we're told that the Holy Ghost was upon him. A general term that should be applied to the life of every believer and how they ought to live. They should know the Holy Ghost upon them. This should be the desire of every Christian, it being able to be said very evidently, the Holy Ghost was upon him or her. Now, this power of the Holy Ghost in his life is developed in two ways. First, we see this Spirit's power, that the Spirit's power is exercised in teaching him. The Spirit's power is exercised in teaching him. Look at verse 26. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. It's the Holy Spirit's work to reveal. He is the divine teacher, the great illuminator. It is His function to shine upon Jesus Christ and to remove scales from sinners that they may behold the Lamb of God. In John chapter 15, verse 26, Jesus refers to the Spirit as the Spirit of truth. And He is called the Spirit of truth because that's what He does. He reveals truth to men. It is part of His activity, part of His labor, part of His work in the economy of God to reveal truth. You see, man does not have the truth. He does not possess the truth in and of himself. No man has a monopoly of truth. Truth that saves, truth that redeems, truth that matters is something that has to be unveiled to us by the Spirit of God. And this is his work. He shows man what he needs to know. He reveals truth. If we can say it reverently, the Spirit, as a teacher, his subject matter, his expertise, is Jesus Christ. And so, Simeon knew this activity of the Spirit of God in his life. It was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost what? Was it revealed to him that he should live a long life? No, that's not what's revealed, although no doubt that's part of what happens as a side issue. The main focus of the Spirit of God and what he reveals to Simeon is in relation to Jesus Christ, that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. The Spirit reveals Christ. And this is not just something confined to the New Testament age. I mean, even in what we're reading, we're still really in Old Testament dispensation. We're still in the era of the Old Testament times. Sacrifices are still being offered. Things are much like they were before the Incarnation. But, but it has always been the work of the Spirit to reveal the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse... Well, we'll read from verse 7 just to give some context here. 1 Peter 1, verse 7, That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Of which salvation? Note this. The prophets have inquired and searched diligently. So the prophets were students of the Word. 
they inquired and they prayed and searched about matters that relate to salvation specifically. Who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. What, there's much in there, but what I want to underline is that these prophets in the past who give themselves to understand salvation, their whole lives, their whole ministry is a focus upon revealing God's salvation. The declaration of the prophets has a focus upon God's purpose to save. And as they inquire and they search about these things, they have help by the Spirit called here the Spirit of Christ which was in them. The Spirit of Christ which was in even at that time. It is the Spirit of Christ in the prophets helping them understand what Christ would do. The Holy Ghost that moved in the heart of the prophet, in the lives of the prophet, pointed him to Christ because the Spirit in him was the Spirit of Christ. The chief purpose and activity of the Holy Ghost is to reveal Christ. And even in the Old Testament era, it is the Spirit of Christ that is working in the prophets so that they can unfold God's redemptive purpose. It is all pointing to Messiah. It's all pointing to God's way of salvation. Everything the Spirit does, all of His activity is to point to the Lord Jesus Christ. And while the Holy Ghost was upon Simeon, it is the Holy Ghost that reveals to him that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now again, that's not a blessing that he need to have, needed to experience. Even going by 1 Peter 1 and what we read, whom, whom having not seen we love. We still love him even though we have not seen him with the eye. But this was a particular blessing that was bestowed upon Simeon, a promise that God had given to him as an individual that God would allow him, permit him the joy seeing the Lord's Christ before he dies. But it's the Spirit of God that does this. It's the activity of the Holy Ghost to point to Jesus Christ. In fact, we can put it this way. It is the business of the Holy Spirit to ensure that all the elect that reach an age of maturity see Jesus Christ. Let me say it again. It is the business of the Holy Spirit to ensure that all the elect that reach an age of maturity, see Jesus Christ. Every elect soul that will come to a stage of maturity, they must see Christ. And the only, the only one who actively moves and works upon the heart and shows the sinner Christ is the Spirit of God. There are preachers. And the Word of God is an instrument that is important and vital, I might say, in all of that as well. But as far as, as what God's activity to do the impossible, to bring the dead to life, to remove scales that man of himself cannot remove, it is the work of the Spirit of God. And every one of the elect, every single soul that Christ has shed His blood for, the Spirit is tasked with this labor that He must work upon them or they will never see Jesus Christ. And so he moves constantly. And this is where you have a wonderful lesson for us, even here with Simeon. He knew the Lord. He was already saved. And it said to him, he will not die until he sees the Lord Jesus Christ. But take that out and apply that to the lost. And apply it to the elect. It is true of them. Not one of the elect will die without seeing Jesus Christ. They will behold him. And how will it come to pass? By the work of the Spirit of God. What Simeon experienced as a Christian, a blessing that he had as a believer, if we take it out and apply it to those that are lost, this is the Spirit's work even to those that have yet to see Christ, but for whom Christ has shed His blood. Every last one of them, every one of them, Christ shed his, sheds His blood for them. They belong to Him. And then the Spirit is tasked with this work they must see Jesus. And so the wind bloweth where it listeth. Now well, here's the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. He is moving constantly, actively working in hearts. There's not one single soul redeemed or 
for whom Christ shed his blood, that he will not work upon. He will not fail to act upon the lives of everyone for whom Christ dies to show them the Lord's Christ. Isn't it wonderful? Back in John chapter 10, it's just coming to mind. You think of the language of the Lord Jesus when He, when he says, My sheep hear My voice. My sheep hear My voice. And you read down through that passage, you do it in your own time, and you will, you will come to one conclusion with regard to the voice of the shepherd. It is simply this. Every single person that hears his voice, they will come. Every last one. And we can take that and even apply it in prayer. We simply have to ask the Lord, cause, cause my unsaved family members to hear the voice of the shepherd. If they hear the voice of the shepherd, they must be saved. They have to come. And how do they hear the voice of the shepherd? It's through the work of the Spirit. <laughs> the work and activity of the Holy Ghost. Jesus must have his sheep hear his voice. And the Spirit of God is tasked to make sure it happens. Spirit's power is not only exercised in teaching Simeon, but also in guiding him. Verse 27, He came by the Spirit into the temple. He came by the Spirit into the temple. What a way to arrive into God's house. He came by the Spirit, led of the Spirit, the Spirit always leads the people of God into the house of God. He does. If you're ever at home wondering, should I go to church today? The will of God is. The Spirit of God, if you're led by the Spirit, would be, be at the house of God. I fear, however, that there are too many occasions, even when we come to the house of God, that we do not know much of the activity of the Spirit in our preparation as we come to gather with the Lord's people. He came by the Spirit into the temple. It is a sign of not having the Spirit that keeps you away from the people of God, you know. Jude points this out in his short epistle. I'll read from verse 17. He says there, but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, recall to mind what they've told you, what you've, what you've been taught already. You see, what Judah's doing is rehearsing what they already knew. Big part of the preacher's life. Telling you what you already know, but we forget. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. Now, this isn't outside the church. This is inside the professing church. And he says, these be they who separate themselves. No, it's not Psalm 1 separation, separation from the ungodly. It's not that kind of separation. It's separation from the godly. It's separation from those that love the Lord. They separate themselves. Why do they do that? Sensual. That characterizes them. They are being moved by their carnality. It is their carnal nature, which when you read through Romans 8, you will see this is, the, this is the battle. The flesh, the carnal, and the spirit. To be led of the spirit is a desire of the believer. To be led carnally and of the flesh keeps you away from God's people, out of the place where you ought to be. They separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. They don't have the spirit of God. Or at least as they look on, it may be at times they are professing believers that truly know the Lord, but they're evidencing, they're manifesting a lack of being led of the Spirit. They're not like Simeon, who came by the Spirit into the temple. They're not like that. They're not being led by the Spirit. They're being led by their sensual, carnal, worldly, evil desires. 
separating themselves from the people of God. Finally then, let's see the promise that was given to Simeon. What was the promise? It goes back to verse 26. He should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. This is the consolation of Israel. I wanted to go back and just consider this before we close. This consolation of Israel, it is exactly the same. Seeing the Lord's Christ is waiting for the consolation of Israel. Synonymous terms. Jesus Christ the Lord's Christ is the consolation of Israel. Simeon was not like the regular religious person in that day. He was not a man content with how things were. He was surrounded by people who, when they would be challenged with change, they wanted nothing to do with it. They would fight to maintain the status quo, even crucifying Jesus Christ because he threatened the status quo. But Simeon was not interested in playing church he wanted to see the Lord's Christ. He wanted to see the, the development of God's redemptive plan and purpose in the sending of a son. And he is praying and waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now what's consoling about the Lord's Christ? What is consoling about him? Well, there's so much that we could deal with. Everything really is consoling about Christ. The consolation of Israel is an indication of God's love toward the world. Instead of leaving the world without hope, without salvation, the consolation of Israel is the indication of God's comfort to lost and dying and perishing sinners. But He has a plan for them. He has a purpose for them. He is going to unfold it by and by. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem. Oh, get it. To redeem those who were under the law. It is doing that which they could not do of themselves. The consolation of Israel, that comfort that comes to the sinner, is this understanding that God will do the work to save the perishing, to redeem the dying, to buy back those that could not buy back themselves into favor with God. This is the work of the Lord. The Lord's Christ, this is His work. This is His purpose. Sinner, get it into your mind. Get it into your heart. Christ's willingness to save is greater than your willingness to be saved. He opens His arms and beckons you to come. He calls you. doesn't matter what age you are, what circumstances you're in, what sin you're guilty of. Christ beckons you to Himself. If any man thirsts, come to Me. He calls you to Himself. And His power to save is greater than your sin's power to damn. It's wonderful. His power to save is greater than your sin's power to damn. This is what Paul means when he says, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. This is the consolation of Israel. This is the hope of all those perishing in their sin, lost and dying, on their way to a lost sinner's hell, no hope within themselves, looking up to heaven and wondering what can be done. Yes, I have a plan. I have a purpose. There is a message. It's the consolation of Israel. It is the Lord's Christ. And he has arrived, and Simeon, he is just rejoicing. He is so rejoicing. Oh, to have been there, to be a fly on the wall in the temple that day, see that old man seeing the fulfillment of God's word to his soul. But there will be equal joy here tonight among the people of God if they would see, if they could see, if they had the privilege of seeing. You take Christ at His word. Taking Him as the Savior of your soul to redeem you from the curse of the law and the judgment you deserve. To bow your head Take the promise that he has offered to save. Claim it as your own. And they would be rejoicing, watching on. Everyone who's a Christian would rejoice hearing that news just as much as Simeon rejoiced that day when he saw the Lord's Christ. I trust tonight 
if there's even a glimmer of desire in your heart to see Jesus, to have Him as your Savior, to know your sins forgiven, even the tiniest little glimmer, the tiniest little desire, you will not, you will not rest tonight. You will not go to bed. You will not forget about it until you've got the matter settled and you know you have obtained peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow together in prayer. just say to you again, if I can be of any help to you, I reiterate it all the time, every week. I would not want you to think that there's no one here to help you, no one here to counsel. I want you to know that I am here to help you in whatever way I can. If you need my help, my counsel, my prayers, need to talk with me, please come and see me after the service. I'll be happy to open the Word of God with you, answer your questions, even just to pray for you as you struggle with whatever it is you may struggle with. Lord, we thank Thee for Thy Word. We pray that it might bear fruit in every life gathered here this evening. Give prosperity to thy word. May the blessed Spirit, the wind of the Holy Ghost, take the word, use it as an instrument to save the lost, restore the backslidden, and encourage the people of God. Extend thy kingdom, Lord. Defeat the devil. Accomplish thy purposes. Magnify thine own name. And we ask that thou would give us all a heart like Simeon, a love for the things of Christ, a desire to see him above everything else. Bless this congregation. We're thankful for each one that is here. Be with those that go downstairs for a time of fellowship. Bless the food and the time together. Bless all the conversation that will be had in the moments that follow the closing of our service. And take us to our homes with thy hand upon us, with thy word hidden in our hearts. And again, prosper our lives through thy word. Make us shining testimonies of thy grace through this week. I am in the grace of our Lord Jesus love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Spirit be with all thy people now and evermore. Amen.